All right, this slide, this uh, <laughs> video will continue on with mapping in R using the um, SF package. So we just talked about using the Tigris package to pull in uh, some SF data, specifically in that SF format. In these next slides, I'm going to walk through some other ways that you can get things into the SF format, including taking a regular data frame in R and converting it into that by adding some information about the, the geospatial attributes of the data. And then also by uh, reading in data from shapefiles, which is a, a common format that's used for geospatial data. So often you will get files in a shapefile that you want to bring in and use for mapping. So the Tigris package allows you to bring, pull in state boundaries as well. Um, in some cases, I've found that those can take a while on some computers to, to print out into the map. And so um, I often instead will pull my state boundaries from somewhere else. It's a little bit lower resolution, but it runs a little bit faster. And if you're plotting the whole country, then I don't think there's much of a loss in terms of that resolution. So the maps package has been around with R for quite a long time, and it includes some different functions for geographical data in R. Um, you can run map from that package with state to get state boundaries. And if you want to get the data rather than immediately creating the plot, um, you can put plot equals false and fill equals true. This will create a data set of those state boundaries and then to convert it into an SF type object for this specific one, you can just use ST underscore as underscore SF. So if we look at that data, you can see that we've got each state and then we've got a geometry. And again, it's the multi polygon for, for each of those. We can plot that as we were doing before with adding on a GMSF to ggplot. And here the data is for the US states. That's the name of the object we created the last time. The color is the color of the boundaries and then the fill is the color in the inside. And again, just to illustrate what we can do, that we can use all those ggplot tricks, I've set some transparency here with alpha equals 0 0.5. So you can see that you can see the grid lines a little bit through these. As a note, you can also use xlim and ylim to change the, the boundaries of your plot. You just need to remember that um, for the U.S., if you're plotting the U.S., latitude, excuse me, longitude is in degrees west, which are actually negative. So you need to make sure you put these as negative values. And you can see here when we do that, we're getting just a slice of the full map. All right, so you can create an SF object from a regular data frame. All you need to do are to specify the coordinate information. So you need to tell it which of the columns that you have represent longitude and which represent latitude. And then you also need to give it the coordinate reference system. And this is how to translate your, co your coordinates to places in the world. If you're mapping several SF objects, you need to make sure that you use the same CRS for all of those objects. So um, spatial objects can have different CRSs, and they can be either geographic, like the WGS84 for longitude latitude, or they can be projected. Um, so these are some of the examples, UTM or NADS83. I've put a site to a website that has projection strings that can be useful in projecting um, or reprojecting data. And then there's also a really excellent reference on projections and maps in R from Melanie Frazier. So I'll go to that. This is that information. And you can see it has some different EPSG codes for CRS. Uh, for the data that we're using today, it's going to be this 4269, which is often used for federal agencies. But then if you're using latitude and longitude and it's coming from something that, that's showing the entire globe are multiple countries, it's likely going to be using uh, this code. So this is, is a short document that goes through and gives a lot of information on this, and I highly recommend that you read it if you plan to be using some mapping for your own research in R. All right, so let's look at floods in Colorado. This is from the storms data as well. And so we're going to clean up this data, and then we're going to move it into the SF object type so that we can map it using that GMSF. So I'm taking the storms data, filtering just to the events in Colorado and events with types that are either a flood or a flash flood. Uh, for the next step, I'm selecting out certain columns. So the begin date time, uh, the event ID, 
and then some information on the uh, latitude and longitude of the beginning and the end of the event. Next, I'm taking this from longer data into, so, excuse me, from wider data into longer data. Um, in this case, I'm still using the older deprecated gather, um, but you could change this to do pivot longer to be more current. Then I'm separating the information on um, the, the time and the key, so some of the original information that we get when we pull this together, and then spreading it back out. So once we do that, the data looks like this. We've got the beginning, date, time an event ID, and so you can see that each of these, we have two rows for each event ID. One is for the beginning time, is one is for the end time, and then for each of those time points, we've got latitude and longitude. So in this case, these two columns are the columns with their geographic information. So those are the ones we want to, to, um, to specify when we change this to SF. All right, so to change this into an SF object, we can use ST as SF, and we're running it on the Colorado flood, flood status set, which at this point is a tipple. And then with chords, we specify first the column that represents the longitude data and next the column that represents the latitude. And then the only other piece that we have to do is we need to set the CRS, so STS set CRS, and I'm using that code that's commonly used for US federal data. So if we look now, we can see that this um, CRS has been set right here with the EPSG code, and then that information is also going in for the projection for string that this is a longitude latitude. And we now have this point geometry right here. So at this point, we don't have a line yet between the beginning and the end, but we have a point for the beginning and a point for the end, and it's changed in, into that special column type based on our original column name lawn and lap. All right, so we can plot that now. I'm using the, the GMSF with the Colorado counties first, and that's giving the outlines of all of the counties. And then next, I'm using that Colorado floods. And in this case, I'm going to um, pull out the month from the daytime so we can look at when these happen during the year. And then I'm using the time to show the shape, the time column. So it's one shape for the beginning of an event and one shape for the end of the event. So we can kind of see from here which of these might go together by matching color and then, and then making sure that we have those two different shapes. All right, so in cases like that, likely instead of just showing the points, we really want to group things by ID and have a separate line for each event. So you can do that. There are lots of functions that allow you to work with this geospatial data. Uh, you can do things like create buffers around different geographic spaces, and you can you can um, figure out which are overlapping with which. So a lot of what you can do with traditional GIS, you can do in R. And I have some links at the end of these slides to how you can do that. In this case, we're going to group by the event ID, and then we're going to use the string cast to create a line string. The one other thing that I want to do, I want to make sure that we keep the month information so I can still do that by color. So I'm pulling out the, um, the month of the first date time for each of these. So this is going to be the, the if you look at the data, oh, you can see that we've got um, the beginning date time, but where we kind of like gathered and then spread, we have this repeated for the beginning and the end. So I'm pulling out the month just of the first of those, but it should be the same for both of them. And then I need to do this do union equals false. So once I do that, you can see now that we have just one row per event, whereas before when we had the points, we had two rows with two points for each event. So for each event now, the geometry is a line string instead of a point, and it's got the information about both the beginning and the end locations. You can see here we have two points. And so now when we plot this, you can see that you have lines for each of the events, and we've been able to carry through the information on the month by doing that summarize. You can also create SF objects by reading in data from shapefiles. This comes in really useful. Um, shapefiles are traditionally used with GIS products like ArcGIS, and so a lot of times those are the available formats for reading, for, for getting geographic data. When you pull in a shapefile, 
We call it a file, but, but typically it is a folder that includes several different types of files, and it can include these for several different layers. So the amount of files inside can, can be kind of large, but um, once you break it down, it's not terribly complex. So typically you will have files that might include S, S, excuse me, S, at H, P. <laughs> this gives the coordinates for the, the shape of each geographic object, so the geographic information. Uh, you might have PRF, which has information on the, the way that that data is projected. You might have DBF, which includes data that kind of syncs up with each of those. So when we were looking earlier at the land area in each county, for a shapefile of that, you would have information in the DBF about the data, like, like the land area. So often when you get this, you will get a zip file, and then you'll need to unzip it. And once you unzip it, you'll see all these different folders. All right, so we've been looking at data on storms from NOAA for 2017. And so let's take a look now at how we might be able to pair that up with data we can get from the National Hurricane Center for that same year. That was a big year with storms, and one of the most notable ones was Hurricane Harvey in Texas. The National Hurricane Center gives you access to a lot of GIS data products. So if you go to this link, it will take you here. So they've got information here on current storms, and they have things like the, the um, forecast track, uh, watching watches and warnings for the storm. They have the preliminary best track, so this is after the storm, the track of the storm. And you can see for all of these, it's got three different basins, the Atlantic Ocean, the Eastern Pacific, and the Central Pacific. And right now, we don't have any storms out there um, as I'm taping this, so there's no current data for any storms. But you can go in, oh, sorry. You can go in and there's an archive, and then also for the preliminary best tracks, there's an archive of data here. So we're going to go in there, and we're going to get data from Hurricane Harvey. So Hurricane Harvey was in 2017, and if we scroll down, you can see that we have the PDF. This is just going to show um, an image of that plot. KMZ is another format for geospatial data, and we're going to do SH SHP, which stands for the shape file. So if you download that, you will get a zipped file. And then if we look inside that zipped file, you can see we've got a lot of <laughs> different files in that. So all of them um, have these different DBF, PRG, SHP, those different types of files that we were just talking about. And then there are different layers. So this one is for points, and there's one for radii, there's one for wind swath. So you can see that those all kind of join together several different files in a layer. All right, so this is what we just downloaded. These are some instructions for making sure that you, you get the right file for that. Inside R, if you move this into a, a data subdirectory of your current directory, or in this case, I'm doing it of a parent directory. But if you do list files for the path to this directory that you just unzipped, you can do list files and you'll see all of the files in that specific directory, what we were just looking at. You can also use from the SF package the ST layers function. Again, I'm passing in the path to that directory we just downloaded. And this is showing all of the layers there. So this is taking things that have those different file types, but pulling pulling together and listing the things with certain layers. So we have, again, wind swath, radii, a line, and then points. And this is all just a code for the National Hurricane Center for that particular storm. It's the Atlantic, and then I believe that was maybe the ninth storm of the year, and then this is in 2017 for the hurricane season. So to read this in, you can use the read underscore sf function. The first thing you need to put in is the path to the directory, the shapefile directory that you downloaded. And then you need to specify which layer you want to bring in. I think if you don't specify this, it defaults to maybe bring in the first layer listed in that directory, which might be alphabetical. So in this case, I'm saying I want to bring in the, the line directory. Uh, this is showing the path of the hurricane, the central path. And so if we look at that, and I'm sorry, this is going off the, off the page a little bit, but we can see we have storm number. This is the ninth storm of the year, so that's the same for all of these, these listings. We have the type the storm was at certain periods, so it was a low or a tropical depression. 
And then we've got some information over here. You can see it's going off the page a little bit, but information about the line while it was in that type. And then the same information we've been seeing before um, about some of the, the, the projection and other geospatial details. All right, so we can plot that. In this case, I'm going to show it as it passes passes Texas and Louisiana. So I'm taking the US states that we created before to do the underlying two states here. And I've picked out just the ones where the ID, which gives the state, is in Texas or Louisiana. Sorry, that's off the page a little bit. But um, this is filtering it just to Texas and Louisiana, so we just see these two states instead of the whole country. You could try this with just US states, and you would see the whole country with the path laid over. All right, uh, then for the next step, I'm adding on the Harvey track. So this is what I just read in right here. And again, because it's that SF, it's just gonna pull from the geometry to put on, um, in this case, a line. The color here is showing the type of the storm at each point. I've specified that by doing AES color equals storm type. You can see right here that it's doing it alphabetically. So we've got extra tropical cyclone, then hurricane uh, category one, category two, three, four, and so on. Uh, this is a classic case where if you were if you wanted to work on this graph some more, you might want to go in with four cats and change these factor levels so that they represent the the levels um, for for strength of storm. All right, so that was using one of the labels we got from that shape file. We can read in other ones. So let's read in the wind swath. This is showing what areas were exposed to winds of certain levels. And traditionally, these will show um, one shape for 34, one for 50, one for 64. And they're doing it for different times. And then for some of these times, you don't have winds above a certain level. So you might only, for example, have 34. And over here, we can see that that is creating a polygon. These are continuous, so it doesn't need to be multi-polygon. It's just polygon. But all of this information was kind of embedded in the shape file. And when we do this read underscore SF, it's able to process that and put it together as we need it for the geometry column here. All right, so now we can plot that. And let's look at this plot down here. You can see now we have these wind swaths that are showing how far winds of 34 knots and 50 knots and 64 knots extended from the storm. And we can see what areas of Texas and Louisiana were affected by winds of these speeds. All right, so here I'm adding on first uh, Texas and Louisiana so that we have that, that base part of the plot. And then in this case, I'm using uh, the Harvey wind swath and I've changed the radii to a factor. So instead of trying to do this as a continuous numerical scale, it's doing it as these split values, one of 34, one of 50, one of 64. I've added some transparency to that using alpha so that you can see the state underneath. Um, I kind of cropped this, this a little bit, or I guess expanded it in this case so that we can see some of the storm down here by setting the X limb and the Y limb. And again, these are negative because these are um, western longitude so those register is negative and then finally i've done some stuff here where i'm customizing the viridis for the the fill so i've got the wind speeds um, I, i've changed the name to represent what we're showing i have to set this as discrete equals true because we're showing a factor here rather than a continuous value the option b is using either plasma or magma i think rather than the the default viridis for the color scale um, this begin equals 0.6 just keeps it from showing very, very dark colors on this, I believe. It crops off the, the, the scale, so it's not showing extremes on one end. And then the direction changes from it going from dark to light. Instead, now you can see it goes from light to dark, which I thought made a little bit more sense in this case. So these are all things that you can see in the help files for Veritas. Uh, so this function can read in data from a lot of different formats. There's a whole lot on this in so this SF, rather than having kind of like the PDF vignette, it actually has an online web page for the vignette. So there's a lot more information on that function there. All right, you can find a lot more out on, on these topics by going to the R Spatial website. Some of this is focused more on um, using the SP package, which 
was the most common way to do geospatial data before SF, uh, but still really interesting. And then this geocomputation with R, it's available as a bound book as well now, and then the whole thing is online, and it's just really fantastic. It, it, it is um, going through all the stuff that you can do with SF, a lot of the things that you can do that, that are more um, in line with what you would do with a, a full GIS program. So it's really wonderful if you want to do geospatial data. All right, so um, now to finish up for the class, uh, for the in-class exercise, I want you to see if you can put everything together. So um, this might look intimidating at first, but these are all just different layers of what we've already been talking about. So for this map underneath, I filtered down and I'm showing the number of events listed in the NOAA Storm Events database, but I filtered it down just to Texas and Louisiana and just to things, events that started between August 25th and September 5th of 2017. If you remember, there's a begin date for each of those events. And so this is really focusing on events that were pretty concurrent to Harvey. It doesn't mean they were caused by Harvey, like some of the ones over here might not have been, but they at least in terms of time were at a pretty similar time. Um, so that's one layer that is going to be a really similar process to what you did in the last part of the in-class exercise with events in North Carolina in Colorado. Then the next step is to go and add some of these pieces from the shape file from Harvey. So we've got the path of the storm. In this case, I'm using a constant red color to show that. So that'll be added on with a separate layer and with a separate data set in that SF uh, style data. And if you look through the course notes, you should see some information about creating that. This will actually be simpler than the one I showed in the map because in the notes because it's not using different colors to show category. And then the other piece are those wind slabs. Um, and here I've done some different things with the with the color for those to make it stand out a little bit more as we add it on. But again, that should be pretty straightforward if you follow along from the notes. It's just putting all of those pieces together as different layers in the same plot.